It's nice to be here, isn't it? In each other's company. Keeping good company, the whole of the holy life. Well, let's not um, be in a rush to meditate. I don't think that's a good idea to rush into meditation. But, um, uh, you know, we can slowly find ourselves here. I am... Um, I pay a lot of attention to the posture, not because I think it's important that you carry books on your head, but that you, the posture is, oh, it's the way the meditation begins and the way in which the meditation uh, continues, actually. So, you know, find a position, whether you're at home or here in the room, in which you can be relatively comfortable, but also alert. I like to uh, begin by just rocking uh, from side to side. Yeah. And you can feel those bones in your butt. Yeah. The sit bones are sometimes called. So see if you can discover when you have an even pressure on both of them. You know, you're not leaning on one more than the other. And then I like to rock forward and backward, uh, partly because it reminds me of being on my grandmother's lap. But also, um, you can discover by doing that when you're leaning into your experience too much and when you're pulling back from your experience too much. And as you discover that in the posture, it really helps the mind to recognize that when that's happening too, when you're leaning into your experience too much or pulling back from your experience too much. So see if you can find that center point. And then notice that it's possible to sit with a sense of dignity, not puffed up and proud, but dignified. And that's a subjective experience. It's not an objective uh, criteria for that. So we're being self-supporting. Self-respectful. And we're in a posture that allows us to not only be alert and aware of our own experience, but also to be able to share that experience with others. And then I'd like to suggest that we fling open all the doors and windows of the senses, the doors of perception, the seeing and the hearing, the tasting and smelling, the touch, the experience of touch. And I'd like to draw our attention just for a moment to the sense door of hearing. You can hear the sound of my voice or the other sounds in the room where you're sitting. Then if you attend, you'll notice the silence that's also here. How big is that silence? Is it just in your head or does it extend beyond your body? maybe even beyond the room where you're sitting. And you might notice that the sounds come and go, the sound of my voice, the other sounds in the room, outside the building. But the silence itself is actually undisturbed.
silence is the background, we could say. And if we don't notice the background, it's actually in perfect harmony all the time. And we're only attending to the foreground, the content of our experience. We may only see suffering. We may miss the perfect harmony of things. And then just as sounds come and go in that silence, sensations appear and disappear or change. So you might begin to notice the sensations of the breath, however you feel them most vividly. Maybe it's at the tip of the nose, the way the air dances there. And then the rising and falling of the chest. Well, the way the diaphragm expands and contracts as the belly empties and fills. Maybe you experience the breath in the whole body. Whole body breathing. You know, there are the activities of body, heart, and mind. And then there's the, the um, experience of awareness. It is a kind of holding environment for all these other activities. I'm going to sit like this just for a few more minutes. Awareness as the holding environment. Expansiveness of the silence. The coming and going of the activities at the sense doors. Including the heart and mind. Not leaning into your experience, not pulling back from it. Welcoming everything, pushing away nothing.
Uh, thank you for your practice. So here we are. Uh, Noam asked me if I'd speak a little bit about compassion tonight, a popular subject in our Buddhist uh, clique. You know, in the in, in our tradition, regardless of whatever school we're associated with or not associated with, uh, compassion is actually inseparable from wisdom. Right? There are two pillars on which our practice stands, or sometimes it's said the two wings that allow us to give take flight. Yeah. Come on in. Uh, you know, attempts at uh, compassion without any wisdom are kind of uh, mushy. And attempts at uh, wisdom without any compassion, well, they're kind of heady. Yeah. So compassion arises from the wisdom or the understanding that we're fundamentally not separate from one another. That doesn't mean it's a little red string connecting me to you and me to you. It means that we are composed of the same things. We are made up of the same things. We are of the same fabric, we could say. Yeah. We're each unique manifestations of that fabric, beautiful manifestations, I might say. Um, but not particularly separate. So I, I was in Hawaii not long ago, uh, staying at the home of some friends who are big wave surfers. And they were trying to teach me about waves. I don't know very much about much of anything, really, but I don't less about waves. And they were describing to me how waves form a thousand miles at sea and then come in and through a set of conditions, winds, currents, etc., reefs, they become waves. But all I could see were these giant waves crashing onto the beach and then getting sucked back out to sea. That was about as far as my understanding went. Yeah. But of course, what's clear in that observation is that waves aren't separate from the ocean, right? Nor are they separate from all the subsequent waves that come and go. A simple, easy way to understand inseparability, to understand, uh, yeah, the truth of inseparability. So when you get that, not just waves, I mean, when you get it about each other, then the whole idea of I and other and us and them and healer and healed and all these kinds of ideas, well, they kind of don't hold up anymore. They don't carry much water, excuse the pun. Yeah. <laughs> And this realization, it doesn't require any particular spiritual beliefs or sitting on a cushion for days on end, months on end. You know, sometimes that can help you to understand it. It's just evident. It becomes absolutely clear. And that what becomes clear in that also is that we, us humans at least, are fairly similar in most kind of regular ways, right? I mean, we want to be happy, we want to be seen, we want to be, we want to eat, we want to, you know, live with some degree of freedom and safety, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And once you recognize that, then it fundamentally transforms the way in which we behave in the world. Again, not rocket science, right? I mean, if I cut my left hand, 
right? My right hand reaches out immediately to take care of it. It doesn't ask, what's your religion or do you have insurance? You know, it just reaches out to take care of it. It's the most natural thing in the world, right? Yeah. So, so it is with each other. Children, I think, are better at this than adults because they have um, a more immediate sense of altruism, I think, and less uh, they're less defended oftentimes, and um, they don't have such rigid boundaries. I remember my son and I were walking through the Tenloin one time, and, and uh, I was going to, taking him with me to go see a hospice patient that was being referred to our hospice in one of the hotels down there. And there was a guy laying down in the street, unhoused, unfed, et cetera. And he said, Dad, can we take him home with us? And I said, no, I'm sorry, we can't take him home with us. But we could take him to lunch. And he said, okay. And so he went over to the guy and he said, would you like to go to lunch with us? And the guy said, okay. And we went to lunch together at some little diner cafe down there down down there and and you know we got to know him we asked him questions about him we got to know him and he turned out he was a construction worker and he took a fall off a ladder he hurt himself really bad he you know lost his job lost his health insurance and you know big surprise he was on the streets So this understanding that I'm speaking about here, um, while it seems simple, um, it's really important in understanding compassion because without it, we start imagining that we have to be somebody special, that we have to have a cape, you know, and be superhuman in some way, and maybe be in a Marvel movie or something, I don't know. You know, that we just, but it's really simple. Cut my left hand, my right hand reaches out, cares for it right away, no problem. And so instead of this, this, you know, instead of us being wedded to models that have us being some special human being that has to have it all together before we go and help other people, we feel and see the naturalness of it. So altruism, at least in my experience, it isn't um, um, about self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. It's not about um, doing things because we should do them. We should be kind. We should be, you know, Buddhist. We should uh, shouldn't feel guilty. We were walking, we were driving in to town, and I was reminiscing about my old friend Wes Misker, you know, wonderful Dharma teacher at Spirit Rock, great comedian, fun guy. And he used to say, It's not your fault. You know, you didn't invent sickness, old age, and death. You didn't create greed, hatred, and delusion. It's not your fault. You know, stop taking it so personally. Wow. So, compassion arises, or, well, let me say it differently. Yeah, this understanding arises from the truth that we're actually not fundamentally different, just apparently different. The way we appear looks different. So His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he spoke about this, I remember, a long time ago, and he said something like, I'm going to paraphrase him, there's no, designing, no denying, rather, that our happiness is inextricably linked to the happiness of everybody else. And that um, when society suffers, we suffer. When multiple societies suffer, we might suffer a lot. I mean, hasn't that been going on for us in the last couple of weeks? And he goes on to say, which I love his language, he goes on to say, and, um, and there's no denying that if our hearts and minds are afflicted with ill will, the more miserable we become. And I love that. Straightforward. No nonsense dharma. The more miserable we become. And um, then he goes on to say, thus we can reject everything. Everything. 
religion, accumulated, uh, received wisdom. But the one thing we cannot escape is the necessity for love and compassion. Yeah. So when we have an appreciation for this, it's pretty hard to be unkind to other people. And, um, but, you know, we do it anyway, right? <laughs> we fall into confusion time and again, time and again, and we, you know, trip and fall. But here's the thing, the mask is off. And I don't mean the COVID masks. I mean, the mask is off, you know it now. So now it's your job. Um, Buddhism has lots of distinctions around compassion. At Zen Center, we used to have a book of lists, just lists. That's all. The whole book was just list after list after list. And so it has lists about everything, the five hindrances and three, you know, the four noble truths, all the rest of those lists. And it has many lists about compassion and how compassion is expressed in the world, etc. But... I think of it simply as what we could think of as relative compassion and whoops, and what we could call absolute or universal compassion. Right? And um, when we're engaged in relative compassion, it's when we do stuff. We feed somebody. We bring someone to lunch, right? Or we help someone cross the street, or we work against injustice, stand for justice. Uh, you know, maybe we take on a big task, you know, like trying to bring more mindful and compassionate care to the dying all over the world. And so we will regularly fail at these things, at least I have. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen that mindful and compassionate care has become integrated into all hospitals and all places of care around the world. So I'm, I'm a miserable failure. A good example of this. So it's a never ending project, relative compassion. Yeah. And in my experience, anyway, and probably in some of yours, it's pretty exhausting. And. Um, we get angry when people aren't appreciative of our compassionate acts. So relative compassion is, is exhausting when it isn't grounded in an appreciation of what we could call universal or absolute compassion. Yeah. Without universal or absolute compassion, you know, we're attached to results. We want things to turn out well, et cetera. Want people to be more grateful. But without relative compassion, we don't think of this side of things. Absolute compassion is just a big idea. I mean, it's just a big abstraction. I mean, if we just prayed for peace or prayed for, um, you know, no more school shootings to happen, uh, well, that doesn't do that much good, right? We have to take away assault rifles. Right? So I think of it this way, that we are the arms and legs, the eyes and tongues of absolute compassion. That's how it manifests in the world through us, right? Through you. It's not like, a, how else is it going to manifest? Your job. Your job. Pick one. Pick anything. Pick being kind today. You know, this is how it manifests in the world. So. so I could go on about the many lists of compassion. There's, um, we don't usually think of compassion as, you know, compassion toward someone with whom we have some familiarity or a spouse or a partner, a child, a friend, et cetera, or someone who reminds us of them or somebody who we know on the street who lives in the neighborhood, et cetera. Um, and so it has an, um, there's a kind of, 
affect that arises in us when we see someone else's suffering we want to do something about it so it's referential i, I want to help this person but then there's also what we could call non-referential compassion it means it doesn't have any reference right it doesn't it's not coming about through because you know the person and you're feeling 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 tender toward them um so this non-referential compassion, it can be kind of insight focused, like you've gone on retreat and you've studied and you've gained some insight into what I was speaking about before, our, you know, interdependence. And it, then it just arises in you as a, like a natural response. Cut my left hand, my right hand reaches out. So... This, this, this quality of this non-referential compassion is really like the ground, if you will, of the bodhisattva vow. It's, I, I, I vow every morning I do this. Every morning I vow to save all beings. You know, I, I do that every morning. I mean, how am I going to do that? I didn't do it today. <laughs> but tomorrow, I'm going to vow again. Now, and it isn't just an empty vow. I have to then do something in the day that contributes to that. Yeah. I have to express that universal compassion in a relative way. Yeah. Um, one of the things that really struck me in the last few days with all this going on in Gaza and with all that's happening in our the House of Congress, the thing that really got my attention was a mass shooting in Leicester, Maine. Yeah. It just, this is such an American phenomenon, you know, that I don't know what to say about it anymore. Um, this 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 thing that we do of unprovoked mass shootings against undefended people in an unexpected way. My God. And the worst of those to me, at least in my heart, mind, has been school shootings. You know. Sandy Hook Elementary, Columbine, Virginia Tech, Parkland. You know, we could name more. I remember when these shootings were rare. I'm old, so I can remember that. But now it just seems that we've become numb to these events. Compassion arises as an appropriate response to suffering, right? Now, the thing about that is that if we don't have much contact with suffering, not much compassion. So we have to engage, actively engaged in wanting to see and not turn away from suffering. Cool. But we have so many ways of distracting ourselves from that huh i mean think of all the ways that we have about we're like masters of distraction and when people ask you what your practice is if you're really truthful you would say distraction <laughs> i mean you say paying attention mindfulness all these things but actually you practice distraction most of the day if you're like me <sighs> but i also read the newspaper not necessarily because I think it's going to get me the truth. I don't necessarily think that's going to necessarily live there, but it's going to help expose me to suffering. And I have to be careful about how much of that I take in and the toxicity, et cetera. But I don't want to turn away from suffering. And so reading the newspaper is compassion practice for me. Yeah. I'm, I especially attend to school shootings. I don't know why that particular form of suffering 
gets my attention more than others, but it does. And so for decades, I've been attending to that. And back in 2006, I remember, there was a woman by the name of Janice Fagan, and she was a gym teacher in a school in um, Oregon, I think it was. And a kid came to school with a handgun, one of the students, and he shot the handgun in the playground, and he hit one kid, and then another bullet ricocheted off a wall and uh, you know, hit a girl on the knee. And this was going on. He was waving this gun around, just shooting kids at random in the schoolyard. And she went up to him. And she just approached him directly. Incredibly courageous act on her part. Compassion requires courage. And she went up to him and through her... Uh, I don't know what she did, but she he gave her his gun. And then she did something really extraordinary. He had great courage, courage of heart, and she held him. And she she just hugged him, you know. And the police came and all the things you can imagine. And then she didn't stop there. Then Janice Fagan said, I will go with you everywhere. And she went with him to the police station to make sure he wouldn't be misused or abused in the police station. And she went to every court hearing he had over the next three years. It took three years for his case. And she went every time. She really, to me, demonstrated this courage of a strong heart, you know? There was another shooting that I read about in half high school in Bakersfield, California. And uh, a kid came to school with a shotgun. And uh, he was about to enter this um, uh, classroom, um, this one teacher, um, uh, Ryan Herber, I think it was his name, Heber. And uh, Ryan Heber stood at the door, not as the um, tough guy, but he just stood at the door. And he spoke to this kid with a shotgun. And through a series of occurrences, the kid gave him a shotgun. Police came, same kind of thing happened. The kid was loaded with ammunition, by the way. He had vests of ammunition all over him. He was not there to just shoot one person. And what I read in the paper, which really... Um, touch me, was an interview with um, David Heber, who was Ryan Heber's father. And they asked him, you know, like, where did your son learn to do this? What a hero and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, David said, um, well, it doesn't surprise me that my son Ryan did that. He knows the boy and the boy knows him. He knows the boy, and the boy knows him. Compassion arises out of a direct, as a direct and appropriate response to suffering. He knows the boy, the boy knows him. It's the it's the rec it's the left hand gets cut and the right hand reaches out and takes cares for it. And he, he knows the boy and the boy knows him. And it didn't mean that they were neighbors. It means he sees something in the boy that also lives in him. And there's something in him that lives in the boy. Yeah. When my son asked if he could take home this unhoused person off the street, he saw something in him that also lived in the man lying on the sidewalk. Yeah. 
he knows the boy and the boy knows him. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't pass legislation to do away with automatic weapons. That's also necessary. And every chance I have, every platform I have, I speak to that. But um, I want to, tonight I wanted to just talk to you from a, something that we can touch and feel in ourselves, yeah. that we can do something about. It doesn't mean we're going to stop a kid with a shotgun, or, but it can, we can be, we can practice. He knows the boy and the boy knows him. Compassion isn't always about, oh, I'm going to make this heroic act to relieve this other person's suffering. You know, the way in which we can relieve someone else's suffering is just that. He knows the boy and the boy knows him. So who do you need to do that with in your life? And how would how might that be an act of compassion? You know, it doesn't have to be, it could be a stranger, but it might be somebody that you're intimate with. So I had a in mind to do an exercise with you, but I'm not gonna do it, it's too confusing. But let me instead just ask you a question. And this is a question that people are online as well. Uh, if you have an answer, you can raise your hand, digital hand, your golden paw, and we'll somehow call on you. But here's the basic question. Tell me a way you try to avoid suffering. And let's not... So let's not use this as a chance to beat up on ourselves, to flog ourselves. Let's just look and see what's true. What's a way that you try to avoid suffering? It can be simple ways. You know, containers of agen das can be a really good way. Yeah. And it doesn't. It, and sometimes it means that the ways I choose to avoid suffering are also a way that you know I don't contribute to more suffering. But let's keep it really simple. So without much fanfare and without flogging yourself with self criticism, tell me a way that you try to avoid suffering. What would that be? Anybody willing to just say? You can shout them out. Yeah, go, please. Go. Well. I watch my news from PBS. Uh -huh. Yeah, somebody's got to bring the microphone over. Okay. You watch your news on PBS, you said? Right. I watch my news from PBS, but I usually record it uh, because I can't always watch it right when it happens. Yeah. And especially lately, um, where there's been more in depth, you know, in the, like journalistic investigation. It is so heart wrenching that it's not that I don't feel compassion, but I just feel like I don't really need to see all the horrible tragedies and okay. human suffering. So I fast forward. Yeah. Okay. So until I, fast I until right. I see the you know I listen to the analysts talk about Got whatever, it. but I just don't want to see all those horrible images of people suffering and the kids and all this. So that's one way that I okay. Suffering. So I'm going to just ask for brief things here because, like you, I once asked a, I was in teaching a thousand doctors in a room once, and I asked them this question: How do you avoid? suffering and one doctor said i write prescriptions <laughs> and i thought it was incredibly courageous of him to do that you fast forward i fast forward okay great answer at the same time i'm thinking about for example donating to the world food program okay you, like you're also a good person and so you want to do those things too but that's not the question the question here tonight is Tell me a way you avoid suffering, very briefly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who else? Tell me a way you avoid suffering, Greg, briefly. My phone. What? My phone. My phone. I, I, I watch my phone. I tend to my phone. I have more of a relationship with my phone than I have with other people. I spend more time with my phone than I spend with people who are suffering. I get angry. Someone said, I get angry over here. I get angry. And it gives you a kind of protection when you're angry, right? Because it can be feel powerful as opposed to feeling helpless when we feel angry. Sorry? I avoid family. Oh, that's a really good way. 
No, I mean, you know, my friend Ram Dass, he used to say, you know, you want to know how your Dharma practice is going, go spend some time with your family. <laughs> so, but I avoid them. Yeah, it's, it's too challenging and too many old, too, too many complexities. All right, who else? Lots of unhealthy people here on 24th Street and walk into the Dharma Center, just, I just turn away and walk, walk past. They sort of have an imagination that somebody else will take care of this. Yeah, okay. So I I walk past people who maybe are on house, living in the street, and I, this the last part you said is important. I have the imagination that somebody else will take care of this. So I feed the imagination that someone else will take care of this. I think some social service agency will do this. Okay, great. What else? Stay busy. Sorry? Stay busy. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Stay busy. Stay busy. Stay busy. Okay. Stay busy. Yeah. Well, I got a check. I got a to-do list, you know, that I have to attend to. You know? To-do list. You have a to-do list as well. That's exactly what it's Okay. Well, you two should get together. Because, you know, maybe she could check off some of the things off your list. Well, when I get my list checked off, then I will help. Right? Then I'll help. But right now, uh, you know, I got to do the laundry. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. These things aren't in and of themselves bad. None of them. I mean, you know, fast forwarding is not bad. Doing your laundry is not bad. You know, occasionally, you know, taking a break from your family, not bad. Getting angry certainly isn't bad. Yeah. But when we're using them specifically to navigate away from suffering, I don't want to make it bad, but I want to say, what's the impact of that on us? On us, never mind the other people out there that are needing our support and help. What's the impact on us, right? When we do that, how do you feel when you do that? How do you feel when you fast forward? It just feels so powerless. So there's a there's a feeling of helplessness and powerlessness, and so I fast forward because that's how I take care of myself. Now I want to add something to this, which is that we can get empathetically overloaded and it's really not helpful, right? We can get into it a, a kind of empathetic, yeah, overload. I'll just call it that. I'll keep it simple. Um, and that's not very helpful. And so what has, starts to happen is then we start doing things to take care of our personal distress, Right? as opposed to being compassionate. And taking care of our personal distress is not compassion. Taking care of our personal distress is me-focused. Compassion is other-focused. Right? So you can see the distinction between that. Okay, sometimes we have to take care of ourselves, and sometimes if we let in too many images into our mind, we just get overwhelmed, and we get a kind of toxicity which, doesn't, which paralyzes us and doesn't allow us to do anything. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else got a, another one you want to join in that we didn't mention? A way you try to avoid suffering? Yeah. Well, I wonder if this works, but it, it, avoiding some suffering that I'm seeing by attending to other suffering that I can do something about. Is that still distracting? No, it may just be smart, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're saying, I avoid this kind of suffering because I'm going to do this over here. You can't do everything, right. you know? So you do what you can do. And, with, and you do it, honestly, without too much of a fixed attachment to how it turns out. But... You know, you recognizing your humanity and the limitations of yourself, the boundaries are it's essential. It's an essential part of this, right? Otherwise, we're just lost in a sea of suffering, and we're not able to function. Okay. Okay, so here's the second qu related question, all right? So that's those are things, ways we avoid suffering. I want you to tell me a way you experience compassion. Not a story about once you were once compassionate or how it was when somebody was once compassionate to you. What's the experience of compassion like? What's it like in your body? What's it like in your heart? What's it like in your head? When you experience compassion, what's, the, what's it like? Because, you know, we're, uh, otherwise we're just talking abstractly about this thing of compassion. So what's the experience of compassion like? Anybody willing to say? It's very open. Like there's an opening that happens in my chest area. So there's an opening, a physical kind of opening? Does it feel somatic? It's very, yeah, somatic, like versus this okay so the, so there's a relaxation of contraction maybe there's a somatic kind of opening a feeling or a sense of opening okay all right great what else how else do you experience it yeah i went in back tears 
I often have tears coming up. So when you are when you're experiencing compassion, you feel tears. So there's a you're speaking about the empathetic aspect of compassion, which is often the doorway to compassion, right? Um, compassion is the act is an action. Compassion is the action to relieve suffering. It's the wish and then the action to relieve suffering. And empathy is one door, but also there's non as I mentioned earlier, there's non-referential kinds of compassion that don't require us having a, an act. The affect of empathy but yeah you feel tears so that's one of the things that we feel tender tender yeah okay yeah um sort of a hypersensitivity sort of like the listening hearing being more um engaged in in what i'm experiencing okay so the, uh, like a hypersensitivity to the suffering that's there to the story, whether it's a suffering or whether it's it's a hardship, whatever it might be. Okay, so it might be you might be listening to the I'm just paraphrasing here but you might be listening to a story which touches your heart and you can recognize the suffering that's in it and there's a compassionate wish that emerges in you that's what I'm interested in what's the what's the thing when it emerges what's it like when it emerges yeah a recognition. A recognition. How do you mean? As a thought, or it could show up as just like an intuitive knowing, but seeing um, similarity in a person, or seeing the quality of yourself in that person. Okay, so th that's a good one. You said they're all good ones, but the, there's a recognition of seeing myself in the other. The boy knew the man. The man knew the boy. Right? That's that's some of what is going on. And so that recognition, it's you start to feel the wheels turning of compassion sort of emerging. And then, huh, wow, oh, it's like, oh, that's my left hand cut there. My right hand wants to reach out and touch it. Huh. Okay, so recognition becomes an important part. Yes. Uh, it feels very connected. It's the opposite of the lung. Like it feels merged. In the so, uh, so it feels connected. Yeah. It, it, so it felt. Um, the way that it was popping in my mind as a mother is a how you feel merged with a baby. Yeah. Okay, so um, just to repeat for the people who are online, you might not have heard her. She said, I feel connected. And then she said, um, um, if I understood you correctly, you, you were saying that it's like when you're a mother and you feel this kind of merge with your baby, right? So that's a really important one because I'm not suggesting that we should get merged with everybody that is suffering because that's not healthy. Right, that can be there can be an unhealthy kind of merging that occurs where we mistake ourselves for the other person. But there is something important about what you're saying about being a mother. I take it you're a mother. Yes. Do you remember uh, feeding your baby when he or she was an infant? Yeah. So in that experience, do you remember the first days of that of your child's life? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Um, that's the most present I've ever been was when you're breastfeeding the child. Time, this doesn't... Exist. Okay, so she's, she's saying that in that moment of breastfeeding her child, particularly in those first early days, it was one of the times when she felt most present. Like yeah. time doesn't exist, I'm just right, right here, right now. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, there's another thing that contributes to that, which is that for the child the infant, the infant doesn't have the cognitive capacities to distinguish I and other yet. That's a cognitive growth that hasn't happened yet. So the infant experiences themselves as um, one thing with the mother. You know, one thing. Waves not different than the ocean. Yeah, this experience. So, so anything that's happening for the mother, the infant's experiencing as themselves. Yeah. So that's a kind of emergence which is particular to that experience, which is very necessary and helpful. It, it's a appropriate and positive a kind of attachment that is occurring in that place. And your presence, if you will, adds or contributes to that healthy attachment. Really important. Now, it wouldn't be helpful for me to have that kind of emergence with everybody I've ever worked with, who are, you know, who are dying. But... 
I can recognize, I can see that although we are individual manifestations, we are made of the same cloth. Yeah. That's where that becomes valuable. All right, I just want to make sure, thank you. I want to make sure that we go to the people online because I want to not, I want to make sure we include you. So if there's someone online that's had a response to a way you experience compassion, please let us know. And uh, Karen, uh, who is it? There you are. Yeah. Okay, would you uh, work that for us? Yeah. Hey, Frank, thanks for me. I experience compassion as a magnet. It feels like a pull inside of me. So a magnet, what do you magnetize with? Uh, it's like a force. Force, yeah, but what magnet, being magnetic seems like there's something that's being attracted or that you're connecting to. Yeah. What is it you're connecting to? It's like pulling me to, to help. Okay, there's a part of you that wants to help. Yes? Okay, yeah. great. So that's a very natural, simple way of explaining the action of compassion. I want to help. Yeah? And then we might do that in skillful or not so skillful ways, right? Like if we get merged, not so skillful. But if we recognize and, and we skillfully discern what's needed here, then you can be of real help, right? So that will necessarily deal with the relative things that need fixed, you know, needed to be addressed, and also the universal. Like when I'm working with someone who's dying, relatively speaking, I got to help manage their pain. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to open to their dying very well. All right. So I got to first manage their pain. That's very relative, very pragmatic. And then we can talk about, oh, surrendering to uh, the forces that are also uh, occurring here. So beautiful. So the, this compulsion or the desire to connect with the other, magnetic, beautiful. All right. Was there anybody else online that had their hand raised and I didn't notice? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So we know ways that we avoid suffering. We know some ways that we experience compassion. Yeah. Wonderful. Anything else you wanted, anyone wanted to contribute about the way you experience compassion? I'd really like to evoke it in the room. Yeah. Physical sensation of feeling lighter. Lighter. You feel lighter when you uh, when you feel compassion emerging. Uh -huh. Physically lighter. Physically lighter. This could be a new diacrase. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you feel feel lighter. Yeah, okay, good, wonderful. Yes, in the back. Um, I feel kind of steady. Steady. Like I have, I am more of the room. Uh-huh. That's a really not, a wonderful quality that emerges with kind of steadiness. There's a stability that's I part of it. As a teacher, teacher of kids. Uh-huh. I'm holding. This. Okay, so you feel it, you feel it that there's a kind of holding. So... There was a guy, um, uh, Derek Winnicott. He's a, you might know him if you're a teacher. He was an English uh, pediatrician and psychiatrist. And he coined the term holding environment. Yeah? And what that meant was a little toddler, for example, is you know, trying to walk. And that toddler falls down. And the mother or the mothering person scoops up this child holds his child kindly, gently, appropriately, and then sets the child back down, and the child continues. And often what was discovered was that the child can go further than they first imagined they could go. Now, that happened in many different kinds of activities, not just in walking or crawling. It happened in many kinds of activities. A child could take in more food, for example, et cetera. So he coined this term holding environment. When there was appropriate holding, then things, other things could happen. Things that we couldn't have imagined, like saving all beings. <laughs> so suppose I suggested to you, when you sit down and you do the posture adjustments we were making at the beginning here, but then you set an aspiration in your meditation practice that you might discover a holding environment. Suppose your suppose awareness was a holding environment. Not that it fixes everything and it makes everything yummy and good. It just holds. 
I mean, isn't that what we do? Isn't that what our awareness practice does? It holds. It doesn't reject. It doesn't try and grab. It just holds. You know, it's like we, we think there are only two things we can do. We can express or repress, right? That's our idea. And when I say to you there's a third option, what is it? Contain. I say contain. Well, contain, that sounds like, you know, I'm... I'm being imprisoned here or something like that. No, no. Containment is holding. It's just held. And gradually, we learn to hold more skillfully. And we hold whatever's emerging, the craziness in our minds, the, all the strong feelings in our hearts, the sensations that are occurring in our body. We just hold them. And in the holding of them, they are free to unfold, to reveal themselves, to show us what's true about our experience, just as we're beginning to discover a little bit about what compassion's like. Right? We don't know what it's like. We hold the question, we hold the possibility, and then things reveal themselves. Yeah. So the holy environment becomes a really important element in compassion, not just that I'm the good guy coming in on the white horse holding the people that are suffering. I know what it's like to have a holding environment in me. It starts here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really bad at self-compassion. Just never my thing. So you'd think I'd be good at it by now, right? You also think I'd be really good at packing because I travel a lot, but I'm still bad at that too. But when I've had various illnesses, I've had heart attacks, I've had five strokes, I've you know had serious life-threatening activities. And so when I would lie in bed at night, um, it was actually very hard for me to be compassionate to myself, even though, you know, I do all this stuff, right? So what I would do is I would lie in bed at night and I would think about all the people who, like me, were scared and alone. And when I did, my innate compassion, kind of like the recognition that you were speaking of a moment ago, began to emerge. This innate non-referential compassion just began to emerge. I didn't even know who I was doing it with. But for the suffering of the world, the suffering beings of the world, it started to emerge. And guess what? It would spill over onto me very easily. Yeah. So that's how I would put myself to sleep at night, thinking about the suffering beings of the world. Now, you'd think that would keep you up at night, but actually, it, it actually soothed me. And then in the morning, I would um, evoke, in, in this tradition, what we would call metta or loving kindness or just love, because when we lose track with how to stay with suffering and we lose track with compassion, we need to redevelop it. And the way we redevelop it is to reconnect with love. And so in the morning, I would wake up and I would say, okay, love, what would you have me do today? Just that was my question. And the sense of love would emerge and it would provide some kind of guidance for me. So when we speak about the Brahma Viharas, the four heavenly abodes or the four sublime states, they're called by different names, four immeasurables. The basis of those is love, right? You were talking about the mother's love, right? We can think of it that way. The mother's love, the holding environment we were speaking of. Now, when that love comes into contact with suffering, it takes the form or shape of compassion. That's what it does. When that love comes in contact with really good conditions, you know, you've just got a new place to live or a new relationship that seems good for you, I feel joy. I feel appreciative joy for your good conditions, and I want them to continue. Just as with compassion, I want the suffering to end. I want to alleviate that suffering. Wow. Okay, so love takes the shape of compassion as it touches suffering, and then as it touches good things, wow, I want it to continue. Yeah. The equanimity, the fourth of the four Brahma Viharas, is a, still a face of love. It's a, I call it a flavor of love. But it has a slightly different role. What equanimity does is it balances the other three 
forms of love and it um, protects them. So it protects loving kindness because it, um, it, it, it keeps it from becoming too preferential so that that loving kindness can be expanded as someone was saying earlier in their opening and be can be expressed and felt for ultimately all beings in all directions and when it comes to compassion equanimity helps because it's easy to get overwhelmed by suffering right oh man oh there's so much suffering in the world i got to go do something maybe i should go to gaza this week you know equanimity helps to balance that it says okay wait slow down frank find your ground here get some boundaries you're getting swept away and equanimity brings a kind of steadfastness to joy because what can happen with joy is it can get so effervescent and you know like champagne or bubbly water or something like this and it's hard to sustain that over time actually that joy so we spill it you know and so what equanimity does is allow us to it brings a kind of steadfastness a stability to that joy so it can be it can continue over time over a lifetime or lifetimes even yeah so those are the four flavors of of love that uh, of which compassion is one right okay i'm going on here To me, anyway, and I can only speak if, to me, my friend Bernie Glassman, he used to say, in my opinion, and he would then talk about the Dharma, and he'd say, in my opinion, the Buddha taught, taught this, because that's all he had, really, was his view, his opinion. And, um, he wasn't like Ananda, you know, the Buddhist attendant who supposedly had a photographic memory. How we, how we've decided that, <laughs> two thousand years later, that he had a photographic memory when there weren't even photos. I don't know, but apparently he had good memory, which I don't have. Anyway, in my opinion, it all begins with a willingness to not know, to just not know so much. You know, when we're, when we're so full of our knowing, there's no room for anything else to enter. And so when we don't know, when we're willing to not know, it doesn't mean we're trying to encourage ignorance or be stupid or any of those things. In this not knowing that I'm referring to, it's off the charts from ignorance and, and knowing that we know, conventionally think of, you know, it's just an openness. It's a wonder. It's a wish to discover. Yeah. And that links to this basic love we were talking about, because what it comes down to is not just love for all beings, which is kind of abstract, but a love to know the truth. I want to know what's true. And it's not like there's one big truth that Buddhism or any other philosophy has the corner market on. It just means I want to know what's true right now, right here, right now. I want to know what's true. What's true in my body? What's true in my heart? What's true in my mind? Yeah. And the more I discover about that, the more truth reveals itself. Yeah. And the more skillful means start to get, start to present themselves. And then I can go through the world and act with some degree of usefulness. Yeah. So, starts with not knowing. As Bernie would say, it starts with not knowing. It's, it then grows into being willing to bear witness, just be open to suffering, read the newspaper. And then that leads us to some skillful action, to a loving action, to compassionate action. And that was Bernie's three tenets. Not knowing, bear witness, compassionate actions. Okay, I, I, I've talked enough now, I think.
So maybe you have uh, either online or here in the room, you have some uh, thing you want to say or share, or maybe you think this is a lot of hooey, what I've just been talking about, and you disagree completely. That's okay with me. That's all right with me. Um, but if you have a comment or a question or something you want to ask or speak about, let's just open it to a dialogue for that. Do you want to use the mic for this part? Uh, so, yes, use the mic, then people online can hear, right? Yes. Yeah, I want people online to be able to hear. Okay, sorry. Uh, Hi. Un unrelated to uh, compassion, but I just wanted to ask you, how was it like to be with Ramdas? Ramdas? Yes. He wanted to know, how was it like to be with Ramdas? He was interested in compassion, but he really wanted to know, how was it like? Uh, well, it was a mix of things often, you know. Uh, honestly, truthfully, uh, years ago, I didn't like him very much, you know. I remember he came to Zen Hospice once years ago and came to give a talk and, you know, spoke with the volunteers and stuff. And um, and I thought he was kind of arrogant, actually, because he said, you know, you want to work with the dying, but I just want to work with people who want to go to God. And I said, well, I'm going to go upstairs and work with all the other people. <laughs> Um, so sometimes we didn't get along. We, we disagreed. But actually, um, after his strokes, I loved him a lot more. Because, um, because first of all, he was really in his body after his strokes, and a very painful body. And uh, it, it, his, the depth of his compassion and love grew in leaps and bounds. And we were good friends, and so we would teach together, and I'd hang out at his house, and we'd have breakfast together, whatever it was. And uh, and uh, when we were when we were all memorializing him, when we had a celebration, um, and a number of us were there, Krishna Das and Jack and me and a bunch of other people, uh, Krishna Das said something. Oh, Ramdas finally became the love that he was always talking about. And I, I thought that was a really good description. He'd always talked about love, and he was remarkable in his, he was a remarkable teacher for tens of thousands of people. But in the last days of his life, he was nothing but love. Nothing but love. And um, I'm honored to have called him a friend and to, been, to have been with him over these many years, yeah. So uh, he was ordinary and remarkable. Particularly ordinary when he was eating really bad Chinese food. Um, and um, and uh, extraordinary in many ways. There's a good, I'll tell you a story. Maybe you know it. I won't name names, but um, there was a guy. And uh, they were, there was this Indian restaurant Ramdas used to like to go to on Maui, and anyway, we were all there. And, and, and this guy said, Ramdas, you say you love everything and everybody. And Ramdas said, Yeah. And he said, But don't you love me more? <laughs> and Ramdas said, No. And he said, But how about that carpet there? Do you love that carpet as much as you love me? And Ramdas said, Yeah. Because the equanimity that Ramdas had allowed him to not have preferences or enabled him to not have preferences around his love. It could, could shine like the sun. Anyway, time passed. Years later, Mickey brought him this st uh, stained piece of carpeting from that Indian restaurant. And he presented it to Ramdas as a gift. And Ramdas said it framed, actually. And it sat at the entrance to his altar room, you know, to, to, to his living room. And um, everyone thought it was some special, the footprint of Maharaji or something like this. No, it was just a stained piece of carpeting from this Indian restaurant, you know, that helped Mickey to understand that this it was possible for this love to be extended to all beings in all directions, all, all things, all beings. Thank you for reminding me of him. Thank <laughs> you.
Someone online has a comment or a question. Hi there. Um, so I was wondering about um, not getting um, burnt out and overwhelmed from like um, empathy. And I was thinking yeah. maybe, is it kind of like the difference? Like if you get overwhelmed with empathy, it's because like you're, you're literally taking on the pain of the other people. Whereas with compassion, you're still recognizing the pain, but it's not becoming your own so that you, you're not overwhelmed. And yet you can, with compassion, you can still see the suffering, but you can, you're, you're more able than to help because you're not so okay overwhelmed so, with taking on the thing. I don't know. That's the way I was just thinking about it, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. It. It's a good way to think about it. So, yeah, there's something we could call empathetic distress, right? You, uh, you may be familiar with. Um, and it, it comes, actually, uh, the, the challenge there is the identification that occurs. In a way, how can we recognize our inseparability but not get so identified with this other unique manifestation that we get entangled in a way? We get unhealthily attached in a way, unhealthily merged with the other person. Okay, can you tell me your name? Oh, Tanya. Tanya, okay. And Tanya, what what do you what what brings this question forward for you? Um yeah, I mean I can get overwhelmed especially with certain people i love with their suffering um uh, and um just, but then, but then sorry i'm sorry I'm, i interrupted you i'm sorry i wanted to know whether this happens more in your work life or your personal life uh personal with like family members or people i'm close with and then i recognize okay. that what's happening is that then and i really don't like this like i'm I want to, I mean, part of me wants to help them, obviously, because I love them and they're in pain, but part of me mm. wants to help them so that I'm no longer suffering yeah. from, <laughs> from, from their pain. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and I, I, there's a part of me that feels awful saying that, but that's the reality. Well, thank you for being so honest. Yeah. By the way, I don't think you're unique in this <laughs> People in the room here are smiling and, and giggling a little bit only because they share your same predicament. Um, yeah, I mean, let's take this into healthcare, for example, a place I work a lot with clinicians, docs, nurses, et cetera. And sometimes when, um, you know, sometimes we will give treatments to people, not because they have any validity, but because of the exact same situation you're describing. I just can't leave them hanging there. I got to do something. Right? It's too hard for me to see them suffering in their cancer or whatever the particular condition is that they have. And so we're going to do one more thing, one more blood transfusion, one more chemotherapy round, whatever it is. Right. And sometimes that's the only efficacy for that particular treatment. Well, the only, the only thing driving that particular treatment, I should say, even though it has no efficacy. So good that you recognize that. That's managing your own self-distress. I want them to be out of suffering so I don't have to suffer so much anymore. So you got to yeah. do something else to take care of your self-distress than fixing them. So... Um, I, uh, there's people here in the room who know me, so they've heard the story before, but when I was guiding Zen Hospice Project, which I don't anymore, but when I was, um, sometimes in a given week, there'd be 20, 30 or more people who were dying in our hospice or in our two hospice um, environments. And it was hard. It was really hard. And I had a lot of grief. And so I did three things. I went to my meditation cushion and I sat and that helped stabilize me, helped me to make room, if you will, for the suffering that was occurring, the grief in this case that was occurring. But that wasn't enough. It just wasn't, you know, meditation doesn't fix everything. So then I went to a body worker, a friend of mine who was really great and he would say, where today, Frank? And I would just like, point to my shoulder or my chest. And I said, just here. And he didn't do any fancy California woo-woo stuff. He just put his hand on my shoulder, on my chest, and he'd leave it there for about an hour. And I would cry and cry and cry. And he didn't say anything. He didn't try and fix anything. 
But there was something about that physical touch and the relationship between us, the trusting relationship between us that allowed me to really weep. And I'd get off the table and he'd say, see you next week. And I'd say, yep, see you next week. And that was the whole extent of the processing. Okay. So that was the second thing I did. And the third thing I did was I used to go to San Francisco General here where I knew a lot of the nurses and I would go to the maternity ward. And I would go up to the maternity ward and they would give me babies who had been born to addicted mothers, crack cocaine, alcohol, et cetera. And these babies would shake like leaves, you know, on a, on a windy day. And I would hold these little babies and I would just embrace them and I would rock them for an hour or so before I would go home to my own four children. Yeah. And there was something about those babies, and I would stroke their throats because they hadn't been able to take in any nourishment. Stroke their throats and their chests. And there was something about being able to soothe those babies, which was really important to me because many of the adults that I was taking care of who were dying of AIDS and cancer and other illnesses, I couldn't soothe. I just couldn't. I couldn't take away their suffering. Yeah. And so doing these three things, sitting on my own cushion, stabilizing, getting some support that enabled me to grief, getting a good grief was not just a, a grief was a physical experience. It wasn't just a cognitive or emotional experience. It was a physical experience. And then the third thing was, in my case, doing service, even though I was doing service all day long. Serving in this way, in this particular way, was really helpful to me. So those are ways I took care of myself so that I wasn't trying to get someone else's, use someone else to manage my suffering. Okay. Okay. Last question for you, Tanya, and then we'll stop. Um, what's it like when you're overwhelmed? Are you, said, you talking, you know, are you talking like physically, cognitively? Oh, you said I sometimes get overwhelmed when I'm with my family or the suffering of other people that are close to me. Yeah, I just get extremely anxious and just tight and just like, and I just, um, and then if it gets really bad, then I want to just, sorry, my cat is, um, then I want to, then I just check out, like I'll do something to check out, you know, like I'll. Stay there for a second. I just check out. Okay. Because yeah. it gets too, too, too much and then I just. Okay. So before you tell me anything about what you do with your cat or anything like that, just check out. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's stay with the checkout for a minute. When you check out, whatever way you do that, and you might have lots of different coping strategies about how you do that. What's it like when you check out? What do you feel when you check out? Numb. I mean, it's numbing. Okay. I mean, like, so it's you know, like numbing. Yeah. Yeah. It's Go numbing. Ahead. It's, yeah, like I like I just internet surf like for hours or something, or okay. or over or sleep over sleep or overeat. Those are like my three ways of checking out. So yeah, yeah, we all it, it feels it's it's numbing. It's just you know, but it it doesn't it it. But at the same time, that it's it's it's, it's the thing that's bothersome is still there in the background. You know, so it's very yeah. it's not, it, it feels it doesn't feel good. Okay, Tanya, got it. Thank you for describing that. So when you, so when it's overwhelmed, you check out. Let's just hold that as an idea. I, I check out. Now, what's checking out like? You described it as numb, which I would still say is a feeling, but some people would say it's an absence of feeling. When we check out, we maybe have an absence of feeling. So actually, when we get overwhelmed and we check out, we're not feeling much of anything. We just check out, you know, we're not feeling the anxiety. We're not feeling the compassion. We're just checked out. Yeah. And sometimes we do that through numbing ourselves or through some numbing activity, whatever it is, sleeping, alcohol, watching TV, whatever it is. Right. So what I think happens in that case is that we actually want to feel something. It's just that what we were feeling was too much. But numbing ourself, really what's happening in that experience is that we actually want to feel something. And so I think what I learned for myself is, because I had all those same tendencies, is that I needed to parse out something that I could feel. Anything. 
tenderness towards someone, you know, a little bit of a little bit of anxiety maybe, or some some effort, even the idea to numb myself is some wish for me to have some kind of peace. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So to let myself feel that, that I wanted to have some kind of peace, peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of body. Yeah. And that was really helpful to me because in overwhelm, I'm not feeling anything. I check out. And then I have all these coping strategies that I've learned through my life that I habitually repeat in order to what? protect myself in some way. Yeah. So the willing, the numbness is a wanting to feel that activity is a wanting to feel some peace. Yeah. And that's yeah. important. to That's worth your attention. So even if you do all those strategies, remember in it, I want, I'm doing this because I want to feel some peace. And, and that's and, and, really, go ahead. What feels to me like the peace is like the peace of being peaceful with whatever feelings or anything that's coming up yeah. so it's like like that's like good. just like like just like mm -hmm. seeing the okayness in whatever is coming up and yeah, yeah. and but you and not and not and not pushing it away but also not throwing like gasoline on it yeah okay great idea but sometimes who are we can't actualize our great ideas because <laughs> yes. you know they're just too much yeah. you know we're overloaded here and we're, we're reaching for the stars <laughs> start with really what i want is some peace do something very simple it's uncomplicated it doesn't make some giant demand on you that i should be the ultimate buddhist and the ultimate compassion person and you know love all beings I mean, someone asked about Ramdas earlier, and remember, I don't know if you remember the story, but his teacher said, Ramdas, love all beings. He said, love them. I don't even like them. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then, then slowly by slowly, he discovered. But first, he had to attend to himself. So, so in other words, just stay with the just stay with the willingness. Just be willing to stay with, I just want to feel some peace. Okay, that's not bad. And then your capacity to extend that to others may eventually grow. But start there. Start with, I just want to feel some peace. My numbing activity is an effort to try and have me feel some peace. Okay, start there. All right, it'll, thank you. It'll grow. Okay. What time is it? Okay, we're just about out of time, I think we are. So... We have to stop. <laughs> but, you know, it'll start up again. Don't worry. Um, so anyway, thank you for inviting me. I really am grateful to be here with you. Um, I remember as this community was forming, um, I feel uh, kinship with it. And you have my old Zafus here. Those are yours. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed them. I, I had them. I had them um, um, created for the Zen Hospice Project. I don't know where you got them. Oh yeah, someone donated them from when the Zen Hospice Project closed. Oh, do they? Huh. <laughs> yeah. You're meant to be here, Frank. Well, I am here, whether I'm meant to be here or not. Anyhow, nice to be with you. I hope that my words had some, in presence, had some small value for you. And um, yeah, uh, please be kind to yourself and those you meet. Today, I was talking to a friend of mine who teaches people to be home health aides, you know, in, in hospitals and such like that. And um, she did a graduation for them. There was four of them. And at the facility where she teaches this, um, uh, she's been a student of mine for years. And so she's integrated a lot of these things into her teaching home health aides, which is really great. And uh, she invited the other people in this massive organization she works for. And um, they came down and said, you know, you're really good. You remind me of this guy, Frank Ostaseski. Do you ever know? Do you ever hear of him? And she said, "Yeah, you know." And uh, 
So what it reminded me of is we have no idea how our words are going to touch or our actions are going to touch others. We just have no idea. You know, I remember calling Ramdas one day and I was on the road and I was having to give a big Dharma talk to some group and I, I was struggling with it. And I called RD and I said, Ramdas, I just can't find my words. I don't know what to say in this talk. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, once I was, I used to worry about what I was going to say, but then a woman came up to me in Ohio and said, Ramdas, you changed my life. And he said, what did I say? He said, oh, she said, I don't remember what you said. You just hugged me. So, you know, just, just try and do our best to go through the world with some degree of kindness and uh, integrity. Yeah. And if we just love the truth, love to discover the truth, we hold that as our primary practice, then more and more truth will reveal itself to us. That's simple. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very, very much.